Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Paul Richer. Uh, I run a management consultancy called Genesis, the Travel Technology Consultancy, and I advise on uh, anything to do with the world of online and offline technology. So that's me, and I've organized this, this thing modestly called a social media masterclass. Thank you all for coming along, and apologies uh, there aren't enough seats, but I'm glad that you're all here, so that's great. We've got uh, three great presentations uh, for you to hear, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. And uh, let me see now. For those of you who haven't been in one of my seminars before, it, rather than take notes, if you want to give uh, your business card in on the way out, then I'll drop you an email with a link to, uh, to be able to download the presentation. So you don't need to take notes if you don't want to. And if you've already handed in your business card, you don't need to do so again. All clear? Any questions about that? And someone leaned on the light switch, so could you lean on, on the other end of the light switch and turn the lights down again? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, they're not simple light switches. Technician, run to our rescue, please. And, uh... Oh, okay, there we go, lights are going now. Okay, that's lovely. So three great presentations, and uh, let me introduce our first speaker, and he's uh, Ben Jost from Trust News. Let's welcome him, ladies and gentlemen. a lot of people. Yeah, um, thank you for being here. Um, today I want to talk to you about a concept, a concept that we call the circle of trust. And we believe it's essential to get to know this concept if you want to understand what happens out there in the travel industry currently. Before I start, um, just two slides introducing our company. TrustU is an online reputation management provider. So that means we're collecting data across the web, every sort of social content, a review, a tweet, a post, is collected by us and then is provided to our customers that are mostly hotels and hotel chains, but also destinations. We have a dual headquarter. Um, we're based in Dallas and also based in Munich, so we kind of bring a beer drinking cowboy mentality to the table. Um, but let's get started. Um, the circle of trust is uh, about social media. Social media affects people, influences people. So every online user out there is somehow influenced by social media content. It can be a review on TripAdvisor, can be a review on Booking.com, can be a rating, a ranking, whatever it is. Some statistics say 80%, some statistics say 90%. Whatever it is, many, many people get influenced by that. And then they make a buying or booking decision. So they actually buy based on the reputation the business has out there. And then they become guests, and from those guests, some of them become influencers again. And the circle continues. They contribute on the social media platforms and become influencers. And that industry today basically, oh, sorry, that industry today moves the needle for uh, more than three billion US dollars in online travel. And that's true for every social travel channel. And every channel today is some sort of social today. So that's great. That's great for these platforms. It's great for the end users. But what does it mean for the business? What does it mean for the hotel? What does it mean for the hotel chain? What does it mean for the restaurant? Um, because it's affecting their revenues directly plus 90%. So whatever revenue you have, it's based not only on your price and your quantity, it's based on your reputation as well. So we believe you have to do three things, and I want to start with two. First is you don't want to fly blind. You, know, you want to know what's being said out there. You want to know what affects your revenues. So first thing you have to do is like monitor whatever is being said out there. And second thing, if you have a good reputation, and most of the businesses have, you have to market, actively market your good reputation. And I want to give you some examples. So uh, I want to start with monitoring. Monitoring is about, um, as I said before, collecting all of this data. Um, sorry. So collecting all of this data and then basically give you a dashboard. And we are not the only provider, so there are other providers out there. But we give you a dashboard. You get alerted whatever social media information gets in. So you don't have to actively go to a website and look, is there something new? You get alerted 24 hours. And uh, then you monitor it. 
you see what the people liked and disliked, and you benchmark yourself against the competition, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, most of the things you do with ratings as well, you do with reviews and reputation as well. So we did that for about 400,000 hotels. We uh, analyzed more than 300 sources and uh, in 25 languages. Why we did that, we col collected about 100 million reviews and uh, our algorithms went through those reviews to understand the concept, what the people really liked and disliked. So did they um, complain about the food, did they like the service, et cetera, et cetera. So while doing this, we came up with some really great statistics I want to share with you. Um, one is, if you respond to a review, so we analyze businesses that do respond to reviews and analyze businesses that don't respond to a review. And if you do respond to a review, you have 6% better scores on average just by responding. So people um, tend to give then also more positive reviews uh, if you do respond because they appreciate it. So they say, oh, there's someone who cares. Another statistic, um, uh, tw you, you have 12, you can get 12, you, you, uh, $12 in, in a higher room price if you have a 1% better trust score. So the trust score is the overall score of all the ratings and all the reputation you have. That means for just 1% better score and your overall reputation, you can get an average, have an average a $12 better or higher room price than someone else. And one interesting fact as well, if you have 5%, if you have a 5% higher trust score, um, you get, oh, sorry, you have for every 30 reviews, you have more on platforms, an average of 5% 5, 5 better trust score. So a trust score can be um, an aggregate of a TripAdvisor score, a Yelp score, a Booking.com score. So, so that means you have to have more reviews actually out there, not less. And how you can collect more reviews, I, I, come, to, I come to that point uh, later on. Marketing, second step. Uh, we have businesses, uh, our customers, that understood that it's important to take the reputation they have and actively market it. Why is it important? Because 50% of people just don't book at all if they don't find any ratings, right? They go there, you go to the brand.com site, and if you don't find any ratings, they just don't book, and that's true for uh, an OTA as well. If you don't have any ratings there or a TripAdvisor, they just don't book. That means you don't get any revenues out of there. You can increase your conversion up to 35% if you have trustworthy ratings and reviews on your site. So you, you can increase your conversion and can increase your, your revenues if you just put reviews and ratings on your site because it's what What's true for those platforms out there is also true for the brand.com platform. So we, we, we got the trust score out there for free. We have already about 20 million API calls per month for the trust score. So many hotels, many hotel chains, also many destinations put the trust score in it. But you can also, sorry, something is wrong with this. But you also um, don't have to put the trust score in it. You can also have multiple ratings and reviews on your site, right? So that's just a widget we provide as well. You can just tell your user, your end user, hey, that's a point of interest, a hotel or restaurant, and here's how I'm rated across the web. It's full transparency because the, the people will find it anyhow. So you could rather at this point where they are here at your site, just tell them uh, how good you are how good your reputation is out there. So the third thing is um, we think there is a huge potential for businesses to leverage the direct relationship with the guests. So don't leave it to the platforms alone. You have a direct relationship. Many have a direct relationship to the guests. And why don't you just start collecting reviews yourself? And we call it point of interest surveys or point of interest reviews if you want. So how that works, it's pretty simple. You know, you, most of you probably experienced that. You get an email from a hotel, right? And it says, hey, Mr. Smith, you stayed at our property. Please write a review, or write a survey, they call it. And uh, we, wanted, we want to basically switch that old school survey for quality management to a review. 
And um, there are multiple, um, multiple things that, uh, multiple advantages for that. One is uh, you can use it again for marketing. And the other one, I come to that, um, you can use it for review distribution. So you can also um, put it not only a post day survey, but you can put a QR code on, on your hotel or an iPad and ask the guest at the point of interest at the hotel to write a review. So what happens basically, um, I come back to the point, the more reviews you have, the better your scores are up there. And um, we provide you with an infrastructure, or we provide the infrastructure for the first time for the industry to push reviews into other channels. It's kind of, um, we call it review distribution. Think of rate distribution into different channels. Uh, we have the same for review distribution. And why is, it, why is it important? I mean, if you, as a point of interest, collect reviews through an infrastructure like ours, you collect much more reviews than a TripAdvisor, for example. For a hotel that has an average 15 reviews on TripAdvisor per month, we collect around three times more um, reviews. I mean, it's clear, right, all the guests where, from wherever they come from, for whatever channel they come from, they, at the end of the day, they stay at the hotel or stay or eat at the restaurant or whatever. So you have m many, many more connections to your end users, to the guests. You can leverage that, and that's why you can collect a lot of reviews. And as I said, we don't want to stop there. You don't need, as a brand.com, you don't need 50 reviews per month for your own sake. So you don't have to put 50 reviews per month on your own website or for quality management. You, can, you could start distributing reviews. And um, we think that's the future like you collect reviews, trustworthy reviews, and you just say a certain percentage I want to distribute to TripAdvisor, a certain percentage I want to distribute to Google Plus, or I don't know, to a holiday check here in, in Europe. And um, why do you want to do this? Obviously, you have better visibility on these platforms, more reviews, better scores, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the day, that really affects your revenues. So my message for today is like start leveraging the circle of trust for yourself and start working all these three areas, and then you will see an increase of revenues directly. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. It's, uh, we should make a film like that, Circle of Trust or something like that. It's make a good song. Um, let me introduce our next speaker. It's Debbie Hindle from 4BGB. Let's welcome her. Good afternoon, and thank you to everyone who's standing and sitting. We really appreciate the fact that you've taken the time out of a busy show to come and, and listen to this session today. It shows how powerful social media is in, in the world of business today to see such a packed room. My message today is, no matter how small or how big your social media strategy is, if you do one thing next year, it is to work with bloggers. I think before I go into my presentation, I really like to get a sense of the people in the room and who's in here today. So I'm just going to ask you to put your hands up quickly. Who in the room has already worked with travel bloggers in their campaigns? Please put your hands up. Okay. I can't see from here about, is that about a fifth? Fewer? Yep. Who hasn't started working with bloggers but is interested in doing so? The vast majority of the room. And who thinks I'm completely mad and shouldn't be wasting your time by talking about it? Nobody. Well, that's fantastic in itself. Um, before I go on, I also want to ask for one more little bit of interaction. Could all the travel bloggers in the room stand up or put their hands in the air? Okay, stand up and put your hands up. Come on, I want to see you, all of you. Okay, that's fantastic. I'm absolutely delighted to see so many people here today. Just... Everybody spot where they are, come and talk to them. Don't talk to me, talk to these guys. If you want to, at the end of the session, perhaps all gather around here or something, just so that people can meet the bloggers, because I think that's such an important thing that's been happening at the show over the last two years. So good. I'm really glad there's such interest, and I'm glad there's so many people in the room that are interested in this subject. I'm going to talk today about four things. What is a blogger? the value that they bring to a social media campaign, the problems of working with travel bloggers, 
and some really innovative solutions that are coming out of the blogging community itself. So, first of all, what is a blogger? Most bloggers start by writing for private pleasure and then want to develop it as a career and a business. They're not journalists. They are, think of them as publishers. They're entrepreneurs. They're the advertiser, the marketing manager, the director, the editor, the photographer. They're small, individual little businesses. And they really need to be treated like that and handled in a completely different way to the way you may have worked with other types of publishers in the past. In addition to their blogs, they have a lot of other platforms that you can work with them on. Um, advertising and sponsorship deals, they can supply pictures and videos. There are bloggers like Andy de Ross and Zoe from Quirky Traveller who you can pay to blog on your own site as well. So you don't just have to work with a blogger in their own platform. And I think um, this, this slide tells the story rather nicely. There's a, journal, a blogger called Abigail King who left the world of medicine to become a professional travel blogger. And I really like her description on her own website. A blog is simply a regularly updated website. There's no mystique about it. Um, but it's also worth knowing that Abigail last night won an award for best travel photography at the Caribbean Tourism Organization Annual Media Awards. So that shows you the quality of the content that's being produced out there in the blog sphere. And bloggers are also doing many different things. They're becoming publishers. They're grouping together. This is a really little innovative group that launched um, a set of travel guides last week. Um, so we have, um, we have some people in the room from, from there. Jodie Ettenberg, who's a food blogger, sitting at the front here, who's published a book on food, on food based on her experiences traveling and blogging with specializing in food. And there's also a series on... Um, solo travel, sustainable travel, and luxury. And there'll be many more where that comes from. So it's definitely worth downloading a copy. Go to the website and have a look. And bloggers are also producing magazines. This is one by Nelly from Wild Junket, so, who's also at the show this week as well. So there's lots of different platforms and ways of working with them. So what are people doing? How are travel companies working with bloggers at the moment? I'm always curious, endlessly curious. So I asked um, a sample selection of clients and industry earlier this year what they were doing with bloggers. Um, and I got 70 replies from major tourist boards, hotels, airlines, big businesses and small businesses. And some really interesting things came out of it. The thing that people value most about working with bloggers from our survey was the social media amplification. So when they work with a blogger, it's all of that activity around the blog that they really begin to value. Half really value the independent voice talking about their business. And other people also recommended the SEO benefit, having the opportunity to have a specialist voice engaged with a community of particular interest to them. So I'm just going to run through some of these benefits. Bloggers are highly creative, really engaged people who are using social media to promote their own businesses. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know that many people with 100,000 followers on Twitter. But the ones I do are bloggers. This is a screen grab from um, Melvin of Travel Dudes, who has nearly 100,000 followers on Twitter and similarly impressive statistics in other platforms and very high levels of engagement, which is what we need to be looking for. Now, you may say, that's all very well, but what's the value of my content being shared in social media? What's the point of getting involved in a platform like that, whether it's a blogger or anyone else in social media? Well, evidence is increasing that social sharing drives real bottom-line benefit, and we're going to hear a little bit more about social commerce from our other speakers, so I'm not going to dwell on this too much. But I'll just give you some statistics from an organization called Eventbrite, which is um, an events company which has been tracking the value of social sharing for the last two years and seeing how much people buy if they've come to them from a social share. What's been interesting is that in 2010, they found if one person shared content about their products and services in social media, it led to seven visits to their website. And by 2012, one share leads to 17 visits. So they're seeing sharing becoming more important in driving that bottom line benefit. And they track it. They see what people buy as a result. 
so they can drill it down to say a Twitter share now generates $1.85 in extra revenue and Facebook drives $4.15 in extra revenue. On an average ticket sale of $60, that gives them 5% extra revenue when people share things in social media. It's a big statistic. It's a great way to get extra business. And that's why when you're looking at Amazon and all these big brands, they're putting social sharing buttons in everything they can. So do the same, but find people who can also be out there sharing for you. And that's where bloggers come in. Our clients and contacts told us that also they valued the SEO benefit of working with bloggers. And we could spend a whole day on search engine optimization and natural search, but simply search engines like Google are increasingly ranking highly people's personal contacts. And if you're connected to a blogger with 100,000 um, connections, it's more likely to, and they've produced some content, it's more likely to appear on your search. So recently I was looking up um, working holiday visas in Australia, and a blogger who'd written a post about that came up on page one of my Google search. So I instantly went to that because I knew that person rather than going to the brands above it. So it's another reason to think about working with bloggers. Um, companies also said they value niche bloggers, and I've got a whole list of bloggers on the next two slides, which you can oh, try not to hit everyone, which you can go off and um, look at when it's published on on the World Travel Market website. But you can see bloggers do develop their own specialisations. So we have solo travel, Jan Janice Wall, who I think is here today, um, adventure like Planet D, food like Legal Nomads, luxury like Velvet Escape, and sustainable like Uncorded Market. There are lots of people out there with really interesting views on our world. And I asked our clients and contacts what people were already doing with, with bloggers, and the vast majority are working with people on press trips, but an increasing number are looking at working with bloggers in commercial terms too. Again, we could spend a lot of time talking about how to work with bloggers, but some simple top tips. Do your research. They may have amazing statistics, but are they actually engaging with your audiences, your, the, the nationalities you're trying to reach? Is that brand and tone of voice right for you? And secondly, be really clear about what you want to do to work together. Don't assume you can impose on the blogger the, the, the way you will have worked with other people in the past. Bloggers can look at things in a completely different way, and that's why they're so great to work with. You can send a journalist on a trip, and you will get a piece subsequently. If you send a blogger on a trip and there's a festival or a food event, you can, they describe the sizzle as it's happening, as the food being delivered on their plate, or the noise of the festival. They're taking photographs and video. It's instant. It's really interactive. Melvin said to me yesterday, we were at an event together, and he said, I really wish that airlines would understand how much bloggers can deliver to their businesses. And most airlines struggle to get coverage from a press trip or working with with media because they get one small fact box. But we don't want people as bloggers to come to us and say, write about my airline food. That's not a story. People aren't going to want to see a picture of a, a piece of airline food. Take me down to the, to the warehouse where they make the food. Show me why food has to be treated differently to be served in the air. That's a story. Now, how many times would an airline have tried to get a story like that in traditional media? And it just doesn't work. But a blogger can put their personal experience into it and create stories that won't exist anywhere else. So that's all very well and good, but what are the problems of working with bloggers? And there are problems. There are difficulties in finding the right people to work with, identifying who they are. People aren't sure what they can ask for from bloggers, and there's concern about um, evaluation and whether you're wa wasting your money in working with them. So the good news is that there are lots of new creative solutions coming out from bloggers every day. The blogging industry is really young. There aren't many bloggers out there who've been blogging for more than six years. So it's growing really quickly, and people are developing new solutions all the time to the problems that we're facing. This morning, let's just tackle evaluation first. That's the biggest issue most brands face. This morning at World Travel Market, two bloggers, Melvin, who I mentioned, and Keith from Velvet Escape, have been developing up a tool to try and help people um, evaluate bloggers better by creating some really simple um, uh, 
software that you can go into and punch some data in and it will come out with an equivalent advertising value. It's still early days, it's software in development, but you'll be able to subscribe to it and they're looking for ideas and insight what people want from it, so developing things cooperatively. To identify bloggers, go out and meet them. There are some really now well-established blogger conferences which are worth looking at. Travel Bloggers Unite started in the UK. They've had four conferences in the last two years. They've already started taking bookings for next year. And they take about 300 people and they limit the number of industry that can go. It's a great way to get in there and understand what bloggers need from you. And new for 2013, they're launching a book of bloggers which is going to have all the bloggers who visited TVU conferences for the last two years. And you can, sub you can subscribe to buy it. This is just an example page. It's not ready to be, to be launched yet. But um, follow them on Twitter or um, follow me and then we'll let you know when it's available. We also have representatives in the room from TBEX. <laughs> Hi, Rick. Um, which is an American-led conference which has been running for, I think, four years now. First conference was held in Europe this year and they're launching in, they're having a conference in Dublin in October next year and they're expecting about 500 people. They've got TBEX Toronto in June, where they're expecting 1,000 people. And for anyone who goes to ITB, they're going to have speed networking and speed dating. So keep in touch with them as well. Two more new things, and then I'll finish because I'm conscious of time. Um, there is a group of bloggers who've been working together, led by Michael Hodson from Go See Right. I'm not sure if he's in the, the room. Shout if you are. Um, to develop a professional bloggers association. It's not yet launched, but I wanted to tell you about it because it will be a searchable database of bloggers who reach a certain amount of criteria. They've blogged for a certain amount of time, they have a certain standard, a um, certain level of um, reach, and it's going to be a searchable database. Again, you can go into that on subscription and be able to look at food bloggers, um, lifestyle bloggers. it be a great resource for the whole industry. And finally, I just want to highlight bloggers growing together into commercial media groups so that you can buy services from them, just as you can buy them from a traditional print or broadcast media group. So iAmbassador has groups of bloggers who can work together and you can pay them to um, create campaigns that work with your business objectives. So they've been working, for example, with Move and Pick, using a hashtag, going out and visiting hotels and destinations, but all then creating bigger noise around one campaign. A Navigate Media Group is a similar thing of bloggers doing the same thing. They're currently working on a big campaign for Galaxy for the new phones, and they're going out, they're taking hundreds of pictures in destinations around the world, and then um, amplifying them all together. So lots of creative new ways of working. And I just want to add, in this world of blogging, celebrities are bloggers too. They're all out there on um, the microblogging sites and Facebook, and having huge audiences. So I just want to say a special shout out to my client, Barbados Tourism Authority, who this week rather cleverly unveiled a sneak preview of an advertising campaign with a rather small global celebrity called Rihanna, who's um, issued some tweets just before she launched her new album saying, I'm just going to give you a sneak preview of my, my new tourism campaign, and then issued a whole series of photographs which have posted up on her, all her platforms she has 90 million followers across her, her um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram campaigns. And in just a couple of hours, she had more than half a million likes and several thousand comments. That's a really interesting example of how a tourist board is taking this so seriously and working in it in completely new ways. So, it's an exciting time. If you want to know more, there is a um, best practice in travel blogging session on Thursday in, in Platinum Suite 5 and 6, which I'll be at as well. If you can't go, just drop your card over to me at the end of the day and I'll make sure you get a copy of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Fascinating stuff. I didn't realise there were so many bloggers in the room, so uh, welcome to you all. Fantastic. And now we're going to uh, go to the world of social commerce, as Debbie said, and let's welcome Nick Stafford from Living Social. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks, Debbie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, delighted to see standing room only. It's uh, an exciting topic, the whole area of social and 
I just wanted to give you a perspective from a social commerce company. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, Living Social is an Amazon-backed uh, commerce vehicle. We've got social and mobile, very much built in from the start. Um, we've got 70 million members and we're in 20 countries. And uh, we're taking, we're sort of riding on that wave that Debbie and Ben have talked about, which is the role of social content that's out there and turning that into a, a commercial engine. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some macro level trends. Um, I'm conscious that each of you in this audience needs to have a different set of takeaways and hopefully I can cover that off with some macro trends and how I think the travel industry is going to be affected. So uh, let's talk about customers. Um, I think one of the things that I can give you a bit of insight to is that I work at a company where the average age is 26. And the lights are quite good in here. For those of you at the back, I'm not in that category, okay? Uh, but I can tell you what's very interesting about that, and this is an increasing force in the world of travel, is that someone in this category who's under 30 doesn't even talk about the notion of social media. That's not a phrase I, I, I hear. Someone who's under 30 thinks about using these channels to openly share what they're doing, what they're thinking about, what they want to do, what they're buying, where they are, etc. And it's not, a, it's, not, it's not a conscious decision, it's just part of their being. And I think we, those of us who are not in that under 30 category, I think we always have to remember that's the trend that's, that's shaping the industry today. And I'm going to tell you how it shaped a number of industries and how I think it's going to shape the travel industry. So let's just... Um, orientate ourselves in terms of mobile and the web. Uh, this is the speed of progression of radio, TV, the web, and then mobile web on smartphones. And this is a really, really important phenomenon. If you look at the right-hand side here, the uh, green line is the mobile smart smartphone, smartphone growth. And you may not be able to see this, but there's a pink band here, which is a recession. So despite a global recession, mobile smartphone usage is just taking off faster than any other adoption. And that's going to fundamentally change how people buy travel and then also what they actually do when they're away as well. So this is your typical customer today. They're always online. They're sharing. They're not talking to each other except via their mobile phones. Um, but they're, they're looking for ideas. And the key thing that comes out of this is that inspiration is crucial. So when, when Debbie talks about the travel bloggers, the real value of travel bloggers is inspiration. And it's putting stories out there so that our customers can hear about those stories. And then, as Ben said, take an action and purchase. Now, certain people say, well, this isn't material, and uh, you know, it's sort of a bit of a fad. Well, the red line here is Pinterest. Hands up who runs a business that has a Pinterest page. OK, so about a third of you. So hands up those of you who advertise on Yahoo, Bing, or Twitter. About the same. Now, Pinterest, in the space of about seven months, has gone through the roof in terms of traffic. It's overtaken Twitter, Bing, and Yahoo to be a real source of traffic. It's now the second most popular source of traffic on the web. And this is a, this is a business based on social sharing, based on the power of imagery, and I think it's incredibly important for travel. Our industry is sold very heavily using imagery and storytelling, and Pinterest is doing that better than anyone. So, there's a lady, uh, a very smart lady called Mary Mika, who works for Kleiner Perkins in San Francisco. She's an investor in many of the early stage internet companies um, back in the 90s. And she says that social and mobile is reimagining a whole series of industries. If you think about how we used to buy records, we used to go into, our, into the high street. We would buy, uh, we would browse dusty covers of albums to find The Cure or, or The Rolling Stones, depending on how old you are. Well, Fundamentally, that world has changed now. Those shops are closing down. The environment is one driven by online. It's driven by recommendations by your friends. It's driven by constant downloads and streaming. Fundamentally, you reimagine that. When was the last time you went to a job fair? This industry has been completely transformed as well. Our, our brand is online in places like LinkedIn today. We're fundamentally changing the way that we look for new roles or people look for us. Shopping. Uh, this is another one. Uh, this is fundamentally, think about it, was a very sort of in-person uh, experience before and actually limited in many ways. Today, the world is much more customized. It's much more driven by you. You can customize products yourself. You can request products yourself. And you're very much in the driving seat. You can buy multiple times, ret return multiple times. Um, and you've got an emergence of a whole new set of companies that are really changing the retail space. 
So I hope that gives you a sense of, there are many industries. I mean, Mary talks about 40 of these, but let, let's, let's think that she doesn't talk about travel, which is very interesting, uh, the biggest industry in the world, but let's, let's, I'm going to take a stab at it. So I think there are five things that will happen. So first of all, I think you've got the old environment, and uh, this is the environment of brochures, magazines, high street travel. This is the environment of the 80s, which to certain degrees continues today. But when we went through a bit of an evolution, we moved into the online world. I would say that reviews, for me, uh, and OTAs were in the world that uh, it continues to play a role today, but it was a very rational world. Some very successful companies built some very good websites with very rational booking engines, and reviews laid on top of that has really started that emergence into social. But for me, that's only 1.0. I think where we're moving to is this whole new ecosystem. And some of the brands on here may not be familiar, but these are a series of brands that are really built, and, and Ben, I apologize, I didn't put your brand up here. Um, but um, they are, they're brands built with social at the core. Ben's business is very much built on that. His content is driven by customers who are using his platform. And all of these businesses, and I've sort of arranged them so you get a sense of how they fit together. Social commerce is a business like Living Social that uses the power of the social graph to drive transactions. You've got social sharing, whether that's Instagram, which was purchased for a, a billion dollars by Facebook, which is fundamentally about sharing experiences, again, super aligned with travel, through to check-in uh, uh, sort of uh, businesses, such as Hotel Tonight, which is based on, I'm in London, I want to stay another day at WTM, how do I find a hotel? So, oops, sorry. So let's just talk a bit about social and like actually driving transactions. And I'm going to use a living social example. I wanted to use a brand that most people had heard of, so I think Starbucks probably qualifies. Um, so this is a, a, a promotion we did with them. Uh, we never sent an email at the start of the day, which is what living social typically does. We put this up onto living social, and 214,000 people shared this. Uh, 25,000 people tweeted about it. So... And if you take Debbie's maths around how many people share it and how much that drives transactions, you can see that it's no surprise that actually within about four hours, I think it was, might have been seven, well, within a, a few hours, we had sold 1.5 million of them. And that's just using that, that viral network. And what ends up happening is someone goes online and to their, their community on Facebook or Twitter says, I just bought this. You should check this out. And there's a little bit of a bragging element to that, but there's also a... You're in my circle, I really trust this content, and I want you to partake with that. And it works on travel as well. So here is, a, this is the penthouse in Fairmont, uh, the Fair, sorry, the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco. Uh, we did a promotion for $10,000 for one night stay in the penthouse. So Russell Crowe wasn't there for a couple of nights, so the hotel needed someone else to stay. And we sold, pushed this up, and it was up for 24 hours, shared 260 times, probably amongst a slightly higher income audience, and we sold 114 of them in 24 hours. So it's not just about $5 for 10. It can be about $10,000, and that's the power of social. There are other businesses who are really bringing this into the core of their business. This is Airbnb. It's a pretty hot startup. Well, no longer a startup, actually, but a very successful business based on um, places to stay when you're abroad that are apartments. And what they've done that's really interesting is that they've incorporated your social graph into their search engine. So this, this in, includes my social graph. So the top one is a rather nice flat in South Beach. And I, one of my friends, Jose, who is a well-to-do Mexican, let's put it that way, um, and he, I know that he would only stay in the best places. And he's friends with that host. So I know that's going to be a top-notch place to stay. Jenny works for the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and government salaries aren't quite uh, what they, sh they should be maybe in that role, but she's after value. So I know just by looking at those two things and trusting my network, what I'm going to get from that. And Airbnb are driving a huge amount of transactions as a result of incorporating the social graph. You can see here, 85% of users more like to book when they find a friend who's recommending it. And, and the, literally the number of transactions that they're tracking, they actually, Airbnb disclose on their site, and it's just going up all the time. So have a look at that. But this is, what is interesting to me about this is that this is a business who sort of said, okay, we've, we've got this business model that's about traveling. How do, we, how do we explode that? And they've used the social graph to do that much more aggressively than anyone else. And this can work for anybody, frankly. 
And they've gone a little bit further is that they've actually asked the customers to create collections themselves. So Anne, on the top right, she loves places to stay that are sort of like the modern sort of conversion of a brick old building. So she's put a series of collections together about that. So I start getting into, oh, I quite like where Anne travels. Uh, I might like Eve's taste. And I start getting a bit of loyalty to these, almost like a blogger in many sense, someone I trust. Again, very interesting, and letting the customer drive a lot of, a lot of their curation. So that's, uh, that's on the social. Let's talk about mobile, because I think they come hand in hand. We sort of see three categories where mobile is really going to take off. One is in the planning phase. This is Google's new business. I don't know if you've seen this, called Field Trip, which is basically about things that you can do when you arrive in a destination, or maybe when you're planning at the destination. Uh, uh, I'm sure that's of, of interest to people in the, in the destination marketing world. Um, we think there's a second uh, area, which is inspiration. It's amazing that we find that the mobile platform, which in our, for our UK business accounts for about 20% of our purchases, mobile can be a real platform for inspiration. Here's an example of a, of a tour to Nepal. Um, it's a $3,000 tour, and 62 people have purchased that. And again, about 20% coming through mobile. So this is not on low price t items again. So you can use mobile to inspire. And mobile, by the way, here I've used an iPhone, but a mobile I'm thinking in the sense of a tablet as well as a, um, a mobile phone world. And then finally, geolocation. This is Hotel Tonight, um, another really interesting business that basically understands where you are, and then you can serve up content close to you. In this, in this case, someone in New York. Okay, so the fourth thing. So um, I think social and mobile are actually going to be... Uh, Smart business is going to incorporate that into the travel experience. Imagine if you're on a biking tour uh, through Italy, as I like to think of from time to time, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I'm on the tour, and the tour guide is also on the tour, and the tour guide's responsibility is, is to sort of understand where everyone else is. So what we're going to see is we're going to see things whereby people are using phones or some sort of device, and the guide is going to know exactly where everyone is on the route and they're all going at different speeds. From my point of view as a customer, I'm going to know where everyone else is, and I'm also going to know where I am relative to what's coming up. A drink stop, lunch stop, uh, something I should stop at the side of the road. Where is my wife? Is she ahead of me? But, you know, that sort of thing. But I think it's going to be very interesting. You can see it's going to be incorporated into the experience. We all travel with our phones, and we all use them for business when we travel, and I think what you'll see is phones being incorporated into the leisure experience. So finally... Uh, and I, I think this is an incredibly important thing. One of the things that we see in social and mobile is that storytelling really drives behavior. And I think we've moved on from the world of rational booking. And we're, we're looking for greater inspiration. And I think that's one of the reasons why someone like Google will tell you that a customer does 26 searches looking for their holiday. I think what they're looking for is inspiration. And I think there's a whole category of people out there playing in the social world, from bloggers to businesses like us, to those sites that are gathering reviews that, are, that can provide that inspiration for you. So, um, happy traveling, and uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Nick, for that. Great presentation. Debbie, do come and join us as well. And we've got time for some questions. Uh, who'd like to ask the first question? <laughs> 